Have they answered that question? Do you admit you're dirty so as to be cleansed, or do you get cleansed so as to admit you're dirty? All they've done is, script, is, is quoted passages talking about how God will cleanse them. doesn't say anything about what the person does beforehand, at least in this passage. Now, in Ezekiel 18, it does. Cast away from your transgressions and make yourselves a new heart. So this passage does say you're to, you're to cleanse yourself by, um, by repentance so as, to be made a, a, so as to be given a new heart. God will give you a new heart if... You, if, if you admit that your heart is corrupt and you need a new heart, if you fall on the ground like the publicans say, I'm a, woe is me, I'm a sinner. He walked home justified, Luke 18 says. Who walked home justified? The guy who fell on the ground, humbled himself and said, I can't do this. I can't save myself. You're responsible to do that so as to walk home justified. He's not justified, made right, in order to fall down on the ground and admit he's unclean and he's unjustified. In uh, Ezekiel 36, 26. I mean, the understanding from that in which Ezekiel is giving us is that it is God himself is the one who gives us the new heart and new spirit. I mean, that, that was a gift from him. And, and I think, and I'll be honest with you, what, what he's doing here in, in 1830. And nobody denies that he's the one who gives the new heart and the new spirit, which is what I've said over and over and over again. Okay. But what you're, you're, you, team, you, you guys are saying is just in the same way that God gives you a new heart and a new spirit. He, did, he gives it to people arbitrarily prior to them confessing. And what I'm saying, that's not the order in the rest of the text. The order in the rest of the text is that he confesses so as to be given a new heart and a new spirit. And these verses don't say anything about what the man does because it's just listing out what God's going to do to his people. It doesn't say who his people are or what they do. It doesn't have anything about their repentance. But you're surely not denying that the repentance takes place, are you? Of course you're not. You, you believe repentance takes place too, but your order is... I will give them a new heart and a new spirit so that they will confess and repent irresistibly. But does the text say that? No. I will put a new spirit within you um, and, and cause you to walk in your ways and statutes. Remember, being careful to obey my rules, it says. So that sounds like sanctification, which is what I read earlier from verse 37. He's talking about bringing people who are believers into right relationship and saving them from their backsliding, sanctifying them, changing them. Again, contextually, if he's talking to his own people who are believers in him, who are backslidden, the church, versus talking to lost individuals who are being some kind of irresistibly changed over, then that you, you can't contextually use this passage to support Calvinism, as you'll hear them go on, our, our, on to argue from a New Testament passage, ironically. One, what, what Ezekiel is doing is he's exhorting his audience he, to seek these things, the, the new spirit and new heart, not through their own merit, but by way of repentance. And, and how is it that they are, of course, again, able to repent? It's, it's by God giving them that gift. In, in Okay, so, he, and he's right, everything he said was right, um, that it's not through works, but it's through repentance, that this is the means by which to do it. But then he qualifies that by saying, oh, but repentance is, has to be caused by God. And he uses uh, verses, a couple of passages out of the New Testament, um, which we'll go over in just a second, that, that talk about repentance being a gift of God, and th he thinks that being a gift of God means it's effectually caused. When does a gift have to be effectually caused in order for the giver to get full credit for giving it. Doesn't. A, a gift has never been th thought of or taught of in any other context except Calvinism as being something effectually or irresistibly applied. So if I were to grant, let, matter of fact, let's just look at this. If I were to grant um, repentance to the Gentiles, if, if granting means to effectually cause it, doesn't that, wouldn't that necessarily grammatically mean that every single Gentile would repent. Okay, so look at Acts eleven eighteen. Then they heard this and they had no further objections and praise God saying, so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Does that mean every single Gentile will repent? Well, it's what it says. He's granted Gentiles repentance unto life. So that means every single Gentile must repent. Well, no, no, no. He means Gentiles. He means all kinds of Gentiles, all kinds of elect people from the Gentile nations. He's granted them. He's effectually caused them. Well, again, you can nitpick that. You can say, is that what it says? It just says he's granted the Gentiles. See, what I believe Paul and the other apostles are saying in more generic terms, more general terms, corporately speaking, the power of God unto salvation is the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing. 
and it's first given to the Jews and then the Gentiles, as Romans 1.16 says. Okay? So the power of gospel, the power of God unto salvation has been first given to the Jews, thus granting the Jews the power unto salvation by which they can repent. Faith cometh by hearing. So if I bring this truth, this invitation to the wedding banquet, as Matthew 22 parable says, I bring this wedding banquet uh, invitation to you, the people of God first, the, the, the nation, the, the people within the kingdom first, and then I'm granting you the ability to come to the party. If they reject it, which generally speaking they did, he takes it to the highways and the byways, thus granting them entrance into the banquet. Okay, So granting them repentance doesn't mean to effectually cause individuals to repent. It means to bring the invitation, to bring the word by which they have faith. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. The word of God is brought first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, thus granting them the ability to hear and to repent. It doesn't mean to effectually cause individuals to repent, regardless of, of, of their choices. And so he's granting them repentance unto life. So repentance, notice the order there, it's repentance unto life. Remember, regeneration means to be given new life from the Calvinistic perspective. And so if, if the order salutis was correct in the Calvinistic system, then it should say God has granted new life to the Gentiles so that they'll surely repent. Or God has granted certain individual Jew, Gentiles um, new life so that they'll repent. But the order here is obviously repentance to life, not life to repentance. And that's, not the, that's never addressed in these guys' articles. They, they, they focus on the conjunction and and to, but they will not talk about repent to live, repent to live. They just gloss over those things because they see that order does not work within their system. Okay, So John 5, 40 is another good verse. You refuse to come to me to have life. Okay, So what's the order? You come to him through faith. You come to him in order to have life. Now, if Calvinism was true, shouldn't Jesus have said to these people, I have refused to give you life so that you would certainly come to me? Right? Makes sense. He seems to say it's their responsibility to refuse. They're the ones who refuse to come. And because they refuse to come, to, matter of fact, there, there's the word to, uh-oh. He uses the word to there instead of and. Um, so I'm not sure what that means, but we probably should focus a lot on that word. <laughs> okay, so you refuse to come to me. Okay, you refuse to come to what? To have life. Not and have life, <laughs> to have life. Okay, so your responsibility is to come so as to be given life. You're not given life so as to come. Again, cart horse. All right. John 6, 53. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. In other words, in faith, you eat and drink. Figuratively speaking, you have no life in you. Okay. Order clear, is clear there. Unless you eat and drink by faith, unless you believe, there is, you will not have life in you. You will have no life. Okay. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. The order is clearly laid out there as, follow, as follows. The one who feeds on me by faith will live. Living comes after faith, not before. John 20, 31, as we've talked about dozens of times, these things are written, speaking of the gospel, that you may believe. So why is the gospel written? It's a gift. Does, did God have to write these words down and send them to us? No, it's a gift, isn't it? So that must mean if God gives you a gift by writing you down words so that you can understand them and believe them, uh, so that you may believe. Therefore, he must effectually cause you to believe in order for that to be a gift anymore? No. These things are written, are a gift, regardless of whether you believe what he's written or not. But the reason he's written in these things is that you may, not that you effectually will, but that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, what happens? Well, um, you're, that it should say, if Calvinism is true, it should say, and that by, be, by being made alive, uh, you may believe in his name. But that's not what it says. By believing... What may happen? You may have life. So how are you given life? By believing, trusting in him. Order is very clearly laid out. 